So, uh, as I as said, uh, half the week I work as a job in obstetric consultant, and the other half of the week I run a research group trying to investigate the diseases that we're seeing on, uh, in our regular clinical practice. Um, what I'm going to talk about today is I'm going to talk about these new biomarkers in preeclampsia. I'm going to run through preeclampsia as a disease because it's like teaching my grandma to suck eggs if I talk about preeclampsia to you guys. Um, talk about how we currently make the diagnosis and why that's not as good as we think. Uh, some of the patho pathology behind preeclampsia. And I'm going to talk about how these new biomarkers have been discovered and how they're used and how um, we're going to end up using them in much the same way that their non-invasive prenatal testing is concerned. So preeclampsia, as you all know, it's disease of hypertension and proteinuria, and it's also got this myriad of other features, you know, the edema, usually, you know, by weight, represented here by weight gain, visual disturbance, liver and blood clotting problems, uh, stroke, and then culminating in, uh, in seizures. And uh, I think this artist did quite, I mean, that's not bad. I mean, trying to, to paint a picture of somebody having a seizure, that's not bad. And, and of course, then there's the, the fetal side, which is the growth restriction the intrauterine fetal death and the abruptions. So how we currently diagnose it, and how you all currently diagnose it, is this gold standard of hypertension and proteinuria, and that's been the way it's been for donkey's years. And in fact, if you go to the NICE uh, guidance for hypertension in, for preeclampsia diagnosis, it's very clear, it says hypertension in a woman with previously normal blood pressure, this is the criteria if she's got pre-existing chronic hypertension. This is the criteria with proteinuria, and this is measured as point more than 0.3 grams. The problem is that they're pretty, this combination's pretty poor in predicting the onset of the disease and its progression. So we admit lots of people who've got proteinuria and hypertension, and actually not all of them get preeclampsia. And when you look at the evidence, um, this was a study done in 2001, so we know it's not very good, and we've known it's not very good for a really long time, is that whenever, whatever criteria you use, if you use the American criteria or the international criteria, which is this blood pressure and proteinuria, and you try and predict how well the measurement of blood pressure and proteinuria spots a bad outcome, it's got a positive predictive value of 20%. So that means that four out of five people that you're seeing with hypertension and proteinuria ain't going to have anything wrong with them. And yet, this is the principal criteria that we use, and it's not entirely logical as to why we continue to use it. You can represent that data by looking at this graph, and basically, uh, if a test is no different at all from, you know, it makes no difference, you'd have a line that comes down here from the bottom left-hand corner to the top right-hand corner. If you had tests that were really good, you'd have an arch that came up here and went along here. And when you can look at measuring blood pressure or blood pressure with proteinuria, is marginally better than doing nothing at all. <laughs> that sounds much more interesting at all. <laughs> so, uh, how does uh, preeclampsia occur? Well, we all know that it's the placenta that's the root cause of it. And we know that something happens in the first part of pregnancy uh, that uh, causes damage to that placenta. So, and it doesn't matter what these things are, and you'll leave, you can read millions of papers about what different factors might be causing damage to that placenta, but the end result is that placenta starts producing material that gets circulate, circulated into the... I don't know about you guys, but that's really putting me off. <laughs> it gets circulated... I shall start screaming. Uh, so... so uh, <laughs> so it starts producing material that gets circulated into the maternal circulation and it causes this hypertension, proteinuria and the other complications. And of course this damaged placenta causes the growth restriction. And so we know that it's, it's this initial event that leads to the release of factors and these factors make the disease occur later in pregnancy. Two factors that... Uh, two factors that... Uh, <laughs> I don't know why, right, you see what I'm doing? Because she's making me nervous, I'm just moving closer and closer to the screen. <laughs> I'm going to be standing right next to it in a minute. Uh, so, uh, so these two markers, soluble FLIT and PLGF, had been noted, but nobody had really paid much attention to them. And then in 2003, 
there was a bloke called Levine who managed to get a group of patients who a group of patient samples that are being collected for another study. There was thousands of them, there's 5,000 samples. And he got these samples at various stages throughout pregnancy. So this is 8 to 12 weeks, 13 to 16, all the way through to term. And he decided to measure this molecule, soluble FLT1, and he measured this molecule in women who had a completely normal pregnancy, and that's the blue line. Then he ma measured the same molecule in women who actually had preeclampsia, and that's the black line. So you could see that in the pet, compared to the patients in the blue, the soluble FLT was really, really very high in these women. And then interestingly, if you looked at the red line, it was actually higher than normal in the women who actually had preeclampsia a bit later on. <coughs> so he looked at this molecule and he said, well, that's interesting. Let's look at the other molecule. And the other molecule does almost completely the opposite. So the other molecule, its normal pattern is it goes up in the middle of pregnancy and then falls down. And in the women who have preeclampsia, in those same women in whom the soluble FLT is very high, the PLGF is very low. And interestingly, when you look at the women who were going to get preeclampsia later, it was always lower than the women who were not going to get preeclampsia. So this data was very, ex people in the field got very excited about it. And they said, well, that's great, but telling me who had preeclampsia in somebody who I know had preeclampsia isn't really that much use to me. And so they did some prospective studies. So they looked forward. So this was women coming into clinics, high-risk women. And they said, uh, let's just screen them and see if what we saw looking backwards works looking forwards. And actually, in the women who went into this clinic in Chicago, um, the women who had preeclampsia had very high levels of soluble FLT and, again, had very low levels of PLGF. And then they struggled with a way of trying to work out a way of presenting both these two bits of data together. And so what they did was they put one on top of the other and uh, made a ratio of the two. And actually, if you look at this data and this data, it's the same data, but it's combined into one figure. And so here, you could see that the soluble FLT PLGF ratio was higher in those women with preeclampsia. But again, uh, people like Miles and myself and everybody else in this room sat there and said, well, yeah, but I don't need a test to tell me somebody's got preeclampsia. I see her, she looks a bit jittery. She's looking, uh, re hyper reflexic. Do I really need to wait 25 minutes or half an hour for a blood test? So then the question was, um, can this test help us to predict what's going to happen to a patient? So can it tell us what's going to happen to a patient now? And can it do some predictive tests, for, predict, give us some prediction as to what's going to happen to that patient? So there was a study called Prognosis, which was the prediction of short-term out, short outcome in pregnant women with suspected preeclampsia. And I was involved in this study. And we were one of 32 countries uh, where we enrolled 1,273 subjects. And the questions we were asking in this study was, if you see a patient with high blood pressure and proteinuria, is it possible to do a test on them and with that test either rule out preeclampsia for that woman at the time you see her and for the following seven days? And is it possible, if the test is abnormal in, this, in that same group of women, to rule in preeclampsia in the following four weeks? So when we did the, I'm not going to go into the ins and outs of the trial because it's really tedious, and all you want is the results at the end anyway. Uh, and so when you, looked at the, um, when you looked at the analysis of the test, if you have a ratio of less than 38, so that's a lab value that comes back and it says this soluble FLT ratio is less than 38, uh, you, add, you could say with absolute, almost absolute certainty, with 99.3% certainty, that patient does not have preeclampsia and they're not going to get preeclampsia for the next seven days. Um, on the flip side, um, if the ratio is above 38, then you can rule in preeclampsia with a positive predictive value of 36.7%. And you've got to contrast that with uh, what we do now. So our measurement of blood pressure and proteinuria is a positive predictive value of 20%. So it's almost double the positive predictive value of what we do now. So uh, this was published in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it was received very well. And this data, together with a lot of other data from uh, Oxford, as well as Germany and the United States, was pushed towards uh, the National Institute of Clinical Excellence, who agreed that this data was actually quite useful, and so approved the use of these tests for ruling out disease last year. 
and uh, and so uh, in Oxford we've just started to use this test clinically. Um, I have to say it's taken a bit of, of time. And actually the only two tests that were accepted for use by NICE was this triage PLGF test and this soluble flip PLGF ratio. These two other tests were deemed not good enough because there wasn't enough data. So what does the test, when we use it in Oxford, how does it work and what do we use it for? So you've got women, we can use the test from any time from 20 weeks on through till term. And we've made an arbitrary, we've made a cutoff line at 34 weeks for early onset preeclampsia and late onset preeclampsia. So we see somebody in, the, in our MAU, she's got new onset hypertension, new onset proteinuria, she comes in with a headache, you're a bit worried, you think preeclampsia, we do the test, and if the ratio comes back less than 38 in either less than 34 weeks or above 34 weeks, that patient will not get preeclampsia for the next seven days, which means you don't have to admit her, you don't have to bring her back to MAU or DAU, you don't have to bring her back to a clinic that's already full on Monday, it means you can see her in, in sort of a reasonably timely fashion. There's some other data that's been generated which shows that if you're less than 34 weeks and your ratio is above 85, or if you're above 34 and your ratio is above 110, then you've almost certainly got preeclampsia. And then there's this zone in the middle. And at the moment, uh, we don't know what to do with those patients. <laughs> so we just kind of see them again and retest them. But the number of patients in this zone is actually very small. 75% of the patients that you see will come up with a result like that. So I'm hoping, well, you already knew, that preeclampsia pre is a placental disease. And these two markers, soluble FLIT1 and PLGF, are disease-related markers. Um, the ratio can rule out the disease with a 99.3% negative predictive value for the following seven days and can rule in disease with a 38.6% uh, positive predictive value for the next four weeks. And I think, given what we've got at the moment, which is proteinuria and blood pressure, I think it's a useful additional clinical tool. Thank you.